Calvary, it's the Shador family, casual and cozy at home on the couch. We are glad that you are with us for church this morning, and we just love doing church with you, whether it's at church in the building or here at home in the living room. Hope you're enjoying it too. Who likes church at home? Me. I do. Me too. Glad you're here. Morning, Calvary. Hey, first day back on Church Online. Who's excited? We're gonna pretend we're super excited, but hey, at least we can still gather online and hang out and hear God's word and worship him, right? Right, okay, there's a few things that I wanna encourage you with this morning. Number one, first and foremost, when you come to Calvary, right? Like when you come to the building on a Sunday morning, you come prepared, right? You're usually clothed, you usually have this mindset of I'm gonna come and I'm gonna worship the Lord. I'm gonna stand in his presence. I'm gonna be attentive to his word. And so I wanna encourage you that while we're online to still have that same heart posture. Listen, I get it. At home, you got a comfy couch. You just wanna sink in, get a nice blanket, be cozy and warm. And I'm not saying don't do those things, but what I am saying is that if you wanna make breakfast and listen to you know Pastor Adam's fire message while you're eating pancakes, awesome. But come prepared at 10 o'clock, have breakfast ready. If you want to have your coffee or specialty tea or whatever it is you want to drink in the morning, awesome. Have that ready to go for 10 a.m. Hey, if you want to come and worship God, that's great, but why not move things around in your living room so there's space for you and your family to stand, to dance, to worship, to lift your hands? Because the same God that is with us when we're gathered here in the building at Calvary is also with you in your home. And so I, I want to encourage you to make space be um, attentive while you're listening to the message and to the word. Don't be scrolling through Facebook. I'm talking to you, my teenagers. Don't be doing that. Be attentive and come prepared for God to move even in the midst of your home. So that's number one. Number two, you may have seen our post on Facebook, but we are looking for testimonies. Yes, that's right. We want you to send in your testimonies to Pastor Adam at P, no, that's a lie, A Powell at CalvaryBerry.com. Um, and so we want to hear from you. What is God doing in your life? Because we know that he's moving. And so what that looks like is send in a, you know, one, two, maybe five, <laughs> one to five minute video, just sharing what God's put on your heart. What is he encouraging you with? How is he moving? Is there a miracle? And I just want to pause. And we've talked about this as a staff, but it doesn't necessarily need to be some big dramatic moment, like limbs growing out or money shows up on your doorstep in a bag. Although who would be complaining about that, right? Um, you know, if it's as simple as a text, I'll go first. So today I woke up and I, you know, just feel a little bit overwhelmed in the state of the world and just not knowing what the future holds and all these different changes coming in my personal life. And I woke up to a really long text from somebody just saying, I had a dream about you. I'm not really sure if the dream meant anything, but it just had me praying for you. And I want to encourage you in this, that God has you. And just started writing out all these things of encouragement. And for me, that's a testimony that God hears my cries and he hears um, my heart and he hears my prayers. And so by somebody just sending a simple text, that's my testimony this week, that God is listening to my heart and he knows what I need when I need it. So that's number two. Number three, I also want to remind you to stay connected. I know that's why we're making sure that you're attentive, participate on the chat, share, um, you know, this sermon, share, past he, he drops fire. Okay. We've got a pretty awesome pastor. So we need to be sending out, um, sharing. It's that easy. You want to invite someone to church, click share, boom, done. Um, but also stay connected. You know, if you just, you need help, please reach out to one of us as staff at the church. We would love to help you, whether it's financially, you just need prayer, or maybe you just need someone to say, Hey, how's it going? We would love to be that for you. And, you know, text somebody else. If you're doing great, if you're like, man, I'm actually doing really good this lockdown, praise God. Then why don't you as the church be his hands and feet and reach out to somebody in the church to encourage them. Cool? Cool. So those are my three things this morning. Be encouraged, stay connected, and share what God is doing in your life. Hope you enjoy the service today. See you later, Calvary. Come let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, here. 
of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. through every storm and you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and I know you will do it again for your promises yes and amen you have done great things yes you will you will done great Of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive, break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great.
It's me, Pastor Adam, coming at you into your living rooms once again this morning. We are in our We Win series, which is entirely based on the book of Revelation. As a church, we're trying to find a way to have this book make sense and have a way for this book to minister to us through this global pandemic and everything else is going on. So we are in part five. We're looking at the church in Thyatira this morning. So why don't you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter two. We're going to focus on verses 18 through 28, but also just a reminder that at the end of the message, we are going to partake in communion together. So just take a couple seconds, grab that juice, grab those crackers, get in your comfy chair, and let's dive into the word of God together. So are you ready? Let's do it. See, if you're taking notes, right out of the gate, I want us to know that all seven of these churches, they faced tension in and outside of their four walls. Like, it's easy for us to forget some 2,000 years later uh, that the early church was basically composed of two very, very different people groups. See, on one hand, we had the Jews. Um, they came out of the synagogues, and they, um, which was basically this like organized religious system that was buried deep in tradition and 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 culture. And, and then there was the Gentiles, and and those group of people came out of um, this laissez-faire kind of pagan philosophy uh, and practice of self gratification. And so, when the Gentiles came to Christ one of the most controversial things imaginable started to take place. They began to show up at the communion table with the Jews. And I'd like for us for a moment just to imagine the scene here. On one side of the table, we have a Jewish zealot. And on the other side of the table, maybe even sitting right beside him, we have a Roman centurion, and together they are sharing in communion at the Lord's table. What a weird picture that is, because zealots made their living by plotting to overthrow the Roman Empire, and then the Roman centurions made their living by thwarting the zealots' plans by using any means and any force necessary. So, so this morning... I want to blow your mind, so to speak, with some incredible revelation that the Lord has revealed to me. And that's this. The table is always about reconciliation. I'm going to say that again because I'm not in the house with you live. I don't know if you're amening that. Now is an awesome opportunity to sit up straight and jump in and give the TV a good amen. The table is always about reconciliation. Like I've been asked this before. I'm sure you've asked other people this before. But have you ever thought to wonder, why does everything that we do in the church always seem to revolve around food? 
And the lame answer is, is because we hope that people will show up. But did you know that psychologists actually tell us that people are more honest and we're more vulnerable when we eat together because when the brain is focused on something else, like chewing our food and swallowing so that we don't choke, then we tend to let our guards down more. And when we do that, we tend to open up more. Now, why do we think that is? See, I believe that it's because God knew what he was doing when he created us. See, the Hebrew word for meal is the word shul. The Hebrew word for table is the word shulkan. And so we eat a shul on a shulkan. We eat a meal on a table. Now, here's where it gets like, in, like so, so, so interesting. The Hebrew word for reconciliation is also shulkan. See, table and reconciliation are the exact same word spelt the exact same way. And also, the Hebrew word for lambskin is also shulkan. Now, the reason for this is because when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, they didn't have tables. When they killed the lamb, what they would do is they would spread its lambskin out like a picnic blanket which makes the lambskin the original table. All right, so we take that knowledge, and when we read things like Colossians 1.20, when the Bible says that the blood of the lamb brings reconciliation, it, it can easily be seen or interpreted as the blood of the lamb gives us the table that we eat on. I mean, even the prophet Isaiah said it this way. In, in chapter 21, verse 5, he says this, they set the tables... They spread the lambskin, they eat, and they drink. See, table, reconciliation, lambskin, and meal are all the same Hebrew word, shulkan. Why? Because to the Hebrew people, the table is always about reconciliation. Turn to the person sitting on your couch with you or get your phone and text somebody right now and just say the table is always about reconciliation. See, Shulchan is mentioned in the Bible 68 times. And every single time that it gets mentioned, it's in the context of God inviting us, inviting people to reconcile. Let's just walk through the Old Testament a little bit. After Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, remember Joseph's dad gave him this beautiful coat. His 11 other brothers didn't like that too much, and so they beat him up. They threw him in a pit and went to have lunch until the caravan came by to pick him up so they could sell him into human trafficking. We're talking about that Joseph. After his brothers did that to him, eventually over time, Joseph found favor in the Lord. He found favor in Potiphar's house and he grew to a point where he had power and authority in Egypt and over time his brother's fate eventually fell into Joseph's hands and the Bible says in Genesis chapter 45 that Joseph when when when, it, when he when him and his brothers eventually reunited the Bible says that Joseph wept and he wailed but after that was all said and done Joseph turned to his servants and said this, now it's time to serve them food. In other words, my brothers will live today because I've decided to reconcile with them. So let's eat a meal together. In Exodus chapter four, when Moses came off of the mountain, and remember, he's he seen Israel worshiping that golden calf. And he said this, immediately, I want the 70 elders of Israel to come right up here right now. And those guys thought they were in big trouble. But when they got to the top of the mountain, the word of God says in, in Exodus 24, verse 11, but God did not raise his hands against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. In other words, God's response to the first act of idolatry was let's eat together and, and let's make this right. Let's get all of this out onto the table 
so that in the future we can do this better. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 9, it says, So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as one of the king's son. Well, Mephibosheth should have been killed because this happened right after Saul died. And Mephibosheth was Saul's son. You can't have the offspring of the old king hanging around when the new king is about to take the throne. See, in the New Testament, any time that we see Jesus reclining at a table, what is he doing? Every single time Jesus is read or found at a table, he is blessing, he's healing, and he's forgiving people. I mean, we even see Shulchan in the calling of his first five disciples. In Matthew chapter 4, 18 to 22, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and they followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. So we have Peter, Andrew, James, and John. The Bible says they were all fishermen. But the calling of the fifth disciple was a tax collector. In Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's table. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and he followed him. Like, Do we know what it was like to be a fisherman in Jesus' day? Like as soon as the fishermen came in from fishing all night long, and as soon as they docked their boats at the harbor or the marina or wherever these tax collector tables were, King Herod actually had tax collectors sitting there waiting to greet them as they got off their boat from tables. And right away, 50% of their evening's catch went to King Herod's political elites. And then King Herod would take 50% of what was left over, which means if you fished all night, the only thing that you get to take home is 25%. But it didn't even stop there. So after the political elites got their fair share of your fish, after King Herod took 50% of what was left for himself, then the tax collectors ended up taking a portion for themselves. See, today, the average Canadian, I think, pays around 43% of their income in taxes. But in Jesus' day, uh, Judeans, uh, a lot of theologians estimate that they paid between 80 to 90% tax on everything that they made. And here Matthew was, waiting at the tax collector table to tax the snot out of Peter, Andrew, James, and John. See, the first lesson that these disciples had to learn was a lesson around reconciliation. It, it was a lesson around Shulchan. Jesus was essentially saying, hey, can the four of you guys forgive the guy who's taxed you into poverty? Like, I hope in understanding a bit about Shulchan, I hope that Psalms 23 verse 5 is, is making a little bit more sense to us. It says, you prepare a table, a shulkan, before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, does that mean that, that God is going to cook us dinner while he kicks our enemies in the teeth? No, not at all. It means that God always will make a way for us to reconcile with each other. Psalms 34 verse 8 makes sense when we understand this. It says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Well, we get a good taste for the Lord when we understand that Jesus is all about reconciliation. Like this is a series on trying to make sense of the book of Revelation and to see what it is telling us through this pandemic. And the whole entire thing ends at what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. And guess what? It ends around food and tables. So to answer the question, why does everything we do in church seem to always revolve around food? 
Well, the real answer is because it's biblical. I mean, we could say this in multiple ways. We could say that God just loves to party, that, that he loves to eat, that God is the ultimate foodie because gathering around the table is a critical and crucial part of not just um, Jewish uh, culture, but it's a critical part of the church. It's a critical part of the body of Christ being the body of Christ together. Why? Because we're constantly being emptied, we constantly need to be refilled. And therefore, food is supposed to serve as this constant reminder that all of us are welcomed at God's table. All of our flaws and everything else that is attached to that. And Jesus is waiting for us to RSVP to his invitation to eat with him. See, Revelation 3.20 says, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door... I will come in and I will eat with that person and they with me. In other words, I offer reconciliation to the entire world. And if you want to eat, I think Texans would say, I'm game because I love me some good cooking. See, when Jesus invites us to the table, he invites us to reconcile. And how can we know if reconciliation has taken place? We can know that this has taken place if we can get through the meal together in peace. See, if kingdom-spirited people are going to minister together, then we need to be reconciled together so that what we do can be done with unity and peace. And a major question the early church, um, sorry, a major question that, that the early church had and to be honest, it's a major question that the church has today, and, and we struggle to answer it. It's this. It's that are the ways of Jesus compelling enough for us to love our enemies? And so inside this church in Thyatira, the tension was uh, how to love each other. Right? And outside the church of Thyatira, the tension was to hold on to the uh, paganism that they were accustomed to. But remember from last week, there was four simple rules that Acts 15, 29 laid out for us. Uh, just quick refresher. Stay away from idolatry. Stay away from blood. Don't eat meat from strangled animals. And stay away from sexual immorality. Which to us, it seems easy enough. But again, in the Roman Empire, these kinds of things that took place in the church were about as common as finding a Tim Hortons on every street corner which now we finally get to Revelation 2, verse 18, which says this. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now, just some interesting facts about Thyatira. Thyatira actually means hill graveyard. And, and it was the smallest of the seven cities um, that had the churches that received the seven letters from John through Jesus. And Thyatira, important because we're going to come back to this, but uh, the hometown god to, in Thyatira was Apollo, right? He was the sun god. But Thyatira was also this commercial center whose primary goods were textiles, uh, purple dye, and metalworking. See, when I think about Thyatira, it reminds me of when I lived up in Huntsville in the sense that that it was a small town, that it the backbone of the industry was the trades. And the truth is, small towns, the churches in those small towns, God deeply cares about the authenticity of them. And so then Jesus went on to say, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Now, also remember just from last week that the pattern of these letters is affirmation, accountability, and then action, right? Thyatira's affirmation was this. You're doing great on the mission. You're a loving church. You're compassionate. 
You're engaged in social justice. You're being a light in your community by assisting the poor and defending the oppressed. You're, you're caring for the sick. In other words, Thyatira, you're bringing reconciliation to the table. And every day this is getting bigger and better and you're getting more and more and more momentum. And that all sounds really really good. Like, let's be honest, of all the affirmation that Jesus gave to these seven churches, this one takes the cake. This is the one that I want Jesus, my Savior, to say about me, that I want Jesus to be able to say about Calvary Community Church. But, but Thyatira also had an ugly aside that Jesus had to hold them accountable in. Nevertheless, I have this against you, he says. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, mm -mm, who calls herself a prophet. Oh boy. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. In other words, Thyatira was the oxymoron to the church in Ephesus. See, Jesus affirmed Ephesus for having correct doctrine. He affirmed the church in Ex uh, 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 he affirmed the church in Ephesus for for rooting out these false prophets and, and embracing you know proper doctrine and truth. And so he said to them, "Hey, Ephesus, you got all of this right, but you don't love each other." And Jesus affirmed Thyatira for having love. He so he said to them, y "You got the love part right." But because of Jezebel's teaching, you're actually tolerating sin. And the idolatry and sexual immorality that they tolerated, it was spearheaded by this mysterious woman who was named Jezebel. Now, most likely, Jezebel wasn't her real name. She was a real teacher in the church, but most likely, Jezebel was a code name. Again, this is a remez. Do we remember what a remez is? A remez is alluding to something that everybody already knew about. It's where you can start the sentence and you don't need to finish it because you know that your listeners already know where you're coming from. Like, let, let's see if, if, if we've started our own remez here at Calvary. I'm going to say it like this. If we're not 15 minutes early, we're... I hope you yelled late at your TV. That's a remez. If we're not 15 minutes early, you can finish that line. We're late. Jezebel is a reference to King Ahab's wife. It's a remez to King Ahab's wife, and her story is found in First and Second Kings. And she's considered bad news because Jezebel was the one who introduced Israel to Baal worship. And when they were introduced to Baal worship, that was the beginning of the end for all of the northern tribes. And so this code name was attributed to the person teaching the church in Thyatira that Jesus, idol worship, and sexual immorality are okay. Basically, Thyatira lacked this spiritual gift that we call discernment. Like here is the best definition of discernment that I has, have ever heard. Discernment isn't knowing the difference between right and wrong. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. And part of the church in Thyatira was on point with the mission. But the other part of them was running to the altar every single time Jezebel preached about food and sex. And Jesus is saying that, that this isn't something to practice in the church. This is something to eradicate from the church. In our culture today, is it a similar crossroads? What do we tolerate? Where is our discernment meter off? Maybe we could ask the question this way. Where are we almost right when we need to be right? See, Romans 8.1 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, then the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. In one of my life verses, Romans 2.4 says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? So in light of our identity in Christ, in light of our freedoms in Christ, in light of God's kindness, 
What do we tolerate? See, the message to Thyatira asks some tough questions. Questions like, will we be faithful when our lives are at a crossroads? Will we make the right decision when it gets difficult? It asks us tough uh, questions like, will we discern a Jezebel spirit or are we going to ignore it? And to the one who is victorious, does my will to the end, here's the award. I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that word there, those two words, morning star, they're very intentional. Again, who is the hometown god of Thyatira? It was Apollo, right? What was Apollo? He was their sun god. And so John here is contrasting what their culture taught about light against Jesus, who is the light. But Jesus is our guiding light. He's the light that brings clarity. He's our light that heals. He is our light that that changes our circumstances. He's our light when we find ourselves in dark, mysterious places. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But then he turned around and said that whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of of life. So what do we hold on to that stops our light from shining? Maybe we could ask the question this way. What's our idol? Some of our idols are grudges. Some of our idols may be sexual immorality. Maybe our idol is money this morning or the food that we eat. Maybe our idol is an inward focused mentality. But the truth is, is that when we come to Christ, he ends up taking up residence in our lives. And then we become this beautiful reflection of Jesus's light. I'm going to ask the question this way. How long do people have to spend with us before they recognize that Jesus is living in us. See, Mel and I put this to the test every single time we've moved churches and or where Mel's got to get a new job and, and we get new neighbors. See, as you guys know, I just moved here about nine months ago. And uh, before moving here, I lived basically in the middle of the woods. I couldn't see neighbors on each side of uh, my driveway. The only time I seen my neighbors is if by chance we were snow blowing in the winter time and we happened to reach the the front of our driveways at the same time. And we do this like kind of greet or if we were getting the mail at the same time, we would, you know, hi, bye, hope you're doing well. Like, because we were so far out, we, we just never had a chance to communicate together. This is Mel and I's uh, first time since being married where, where we haven't lived in the middle of the woods and, and everything that we preached about being neighborly, like we're finding ourselves having to practice that on a daily basis because, well, my front door is only about 12 feet from my neighbor's front door and we're seeing each other all of the time. And so Mel and I, we always want to put this to the test. See, you might think this is weird, but... I never introduce myself as Reverend Adam Powell, especially when I'm meeting new people. I just like to be known as as Adam. Why? Because it's normal. And so my one neighbor, this happened to me about uh, three or four weeks ago now. Uh, I, I was backing my truck into my driveway and he comes walking across the street. He's like, Adam, I've been meaning to ask you for weeks now. You know, we always see you coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. What do you do for a living? And I just kind of laughed to myself and I said, well, actually, I'm a pastor. And so that's what takes my time. I'm running to meetings. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do events. I'm back and forth at the church all the time. And, and as soon as I said to him, I'm a pastor, immediately he goes, ah, oh, that makes sense. And it opened up this beautiful opportunity where for the next almost hour, he told me his whole life story about how he was in the army and he was shipped off to Germany and he played the pipes and he traveled the world. And what a beautiful opportunity that was just to be able to tell him that I'm a Christian and I'm a pastor and 
I'm a big fan of Jesus, and it broke down barriers. But had I led with that, hey, I'm your new neighbor, my name is Reverend Adam Powell, I don't think that that conversation would have taken place in the same way. And my other neighbor, I see him the most because he's directly beside me. And um, a few weeks ago, uh, someone in their house, um, it was like 11 o'clock at night, and uh, Meatball just starts barking ferociously. And we look out the window when there's blinking lights and there's an ambulance in front of my neighbor's driveway and, and we're being creepers looking through the blinds and, and we see you know, my neighbor get taken out in a stretcher, put in the ambulance and uh, moved away. And in that moment, Mal and I didn't know what to do. Like, like we're like, okay, Lord, how do we be neighborly in, in this uh, situation? It's 11.30 at night. I could go and knock on his door and say, you know, hey man, I was creeping out our window. We seen your wife was taken away in an ambulance. Is everything okay? But then this was like this newly instigated, you know, stay at home order and with COVID and everything, like it wouldn't be appropriate to go knock on his door. And then we thought, you know, what do we do? Do we just ignore it? And I said, well, I, Lord, like, what do we do? We prayed about it. And we thought, you know what? The next time we see him, I'm just going to explain this predicament. And you know what? In the meantime, Mel, we're going to pray for his wife. And so we prayed for his wife and, and we went to bed. The next morning, I see my neighbor and, and I'm like, hey, I just want to explain something to you. And I just like gave him this regurgitation. Like we, we seen your wife rolled out on a stretcher and, 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 and we didn't know what to do. We've lived in the woods. We thought about coming and knocking on your door, but then we didn't feel like that was appropriate. And, and then it, like all of this stuff. And we just said, hey, man, like what happened? He said, well, his wife was, had COVID and, and, and it was affecting her lungs. And, you know, but she came home at 5.30 that morning and she's on the mend. And now two or three weeks later, she's back to normal and good. And we praise God for that. But in that moment on my driveway, I just said to my neighbor, I said, Mel and I didn't know what to do. But I just want you to know, man, we did know to pray. And that's what we did. And he's like, pray? What do you do? What do you do for a living? And I said, well, man, I'm a pastor. And as soon as I told him we prayed, as soon as I told him that I was a pastor, he just got this, like, aura over him. Now, we know that's code for just like this light bulb moment. And he's like, oh, you have no idea how much I appreciate hearing that you were praying for my wife in that time. And so now the real, uh, the, the, the real mountain we have to climb. Now that they, the, the cat's out of the bag, now that they know that we're a Christian household, we're being watched, right? And, and we have to live this out. And I'm so excited to see what, what God is going to do uh, through this kind of relationship. And, and, and it stems back to John 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light life. So the question is, to our neighbors, to our family, to our community, to the people who don't know us from a hole in the ground, is our light shining bright or is our light dim? See, a major part of being the body of Christ is about coming together around tables and eating meals together. And we open this morning by, by talking about no matter what path of life we've come from, that the table invitation is opened and it's always about reconciliation. That everybody that's ever been created has been invited to come to this huge party which takes place around the table and it is about reconciliation. And part of this is about taking the time to repent from the sin that we've tolerated in our life and to repent from the sin that we've willingly carried around. And so God, right now in this moment, we give you permission to search our hearts. And whatever shouldn't be there, we give you permission to highlight it. Lord, don't leave any stone unturned. Where there's idolatry, where there's a Jezebel spirit, we say sorry, we repent, and we turn to you for forgiveness. Let's take the bread together this morning.
the other part of communion is about recognizing that we are only forgiven because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so Jesus, this morning, we just want to say thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your perfect atonement. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. And Lord, we thank you that you are continuously working in our hearts and in our lives. So let's partake in the juice together. So Jesus, we want to be a group of people that honor you in every part of our lives, no matter what is happening in the world around us. Help us to not stumble over what these seven churches stumbled over and help us to embrace what you've affirmed in them. And as we prepare for another week of physical distancing and self-isolation and staying at home, God, help us to shine our light around our neighbors and in safe and creative ways and help us to encourage each other in unique and special ways. And we pray this in Jesus' name.